Good afternoon, everyone. I think we are officially um, on the go and have gotten started. So it is my pleasure um, today to be the moderator for today's special event. My name is Angelina Rodriguez. Um, please feel free to refer to me as Angie. It is um, my honor to introduce our guest speaker today, um, Miss Grace Xu. Um, Ms. Xu is and was born in China. She is active within our community and has devoted her life to teaching um, not only students, but whoever is interested in, interested in um, learning about the Chinese culture, literature, um, and language. So she has a wealth of knowledge that she is um, willing to share with all of us and also open it up for discussion towards the end of the session. I want to respect everybody's time. Um, towards the end, I believe Ms. Xu is going to open it up for um, conversation and discussion with um, every all the participants out there. So again, um, we appreciate this opportunity and uh, really appreciate Ms. Xu for um, helping us to share the Chinese culture and all of everything that she has um, in regards to her knowledge and experience with that. So in regards to that, I would it's my pleasure and honor once again to introduce Ms. Grace Xu. Yes, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I also would like to thank the committee on this American Asian Pacific Island uh, celebration. And also, we want to thank for Jose and to take care of the uh, filming the video for, for, for us. Thank you. So, to. So now you just press this button, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, I just want to have a brief introduction about myself and then the country where I originally came from. Now, I was born in China. Then our family moved to Hong Kong. It's the uh, very southern part along the coastline, the Hong Kong. And then we moved to Taiwan. And after finished college, then right away I came to the States to State University of New York at Albany to pursue a higher education in library science. Even though all my professional job was doing library science, but later on, I did switch to um, language teaching, Chinese language teaching as a job, career, and also as a private interest to do that. So, and uh, actually I retired as a, APS school teacher, Chinese language school teacher. So my children were born in this country. So they're the first generation and I am an immigrant. About China, the, the country of China, and um, it's an ancient country. It's almost 5,000 years of civilization. So to put it into one hour, it's an effort to do it. Okay, but I'm so glad that I could get this chance to share information with all of you. Now, um, China is the fourth largest country in area after Russia, Canada, and U the United States. And um, the population we would have another uh, topic to talk about it. So all this country, they have 20, it has 23 provinces instead of states. And it has 23 provinces. And the capital city is Beijing, right on the mark on the Northeast, close to the coastline, not quite, it's inland. And, um, and then they have five, autonomous region for the minority groups to be there. And then for administrative, special administrative region 
we're talking about Hong Kong and the Taiwan. No, Hong Kong and Macau. And Taiwan is included in the 23 provinces. It's a, right now it's an arguable you know, topic to talk about that. So, and with China as a broad country, see the borderline, there's so many neighbor countries. And China's culture has strong influence and interact with the neighboring countries. For example, Korea, China, uh, Korea and Japan and uh, uh, Vietnam and the Burma and all these countries have, you know, uh, Korea. We all have um, exchange programs and the, the culture influence. And the, as come to for religion, China went to India to acquire Buddhism. You you remember or you heard of the the journey to the West, the Monkey King. So that's is the story along from Xi'an and almost almost to the center of it and um, uh, China. The Xi'an started the, the journey to the to India all the way. So that's how we you know we exist and coexist with the neighboring countries. Now I would like to talk a little bit about Chinese language. First of all, the Chinese spoken language. It's the standard one is called Putonghua or Han Yu, either way. Or as in English, it's Mandarin versus dialects. There are many dialects. What are the dialects? How did they come out as dialects? It because the vast territory of China and due to the natural barriers, the mountains, the rivers, and then so people in certain region and would develop their own special usage of language and then the grammar and the terms. So, that, so for example, people in Canton and Hong Kong, they are speaking Cantonese. When people enjoy spicy food in Sichuan, they have spicy Sichuan food and they have Sichuan dialect. Now, for example, and in Shanghai also it has its own dialect. And we're talking later on going to talk about the province, the coastal province of Shandong, almost like a profile of a camel. And that has its own dialect. So, but the national language they're using, spoken language is Putonghua. In the, in, um, in the big cities and small towns, at the airport or train station or news announcement, it's all use Putonghua. So now Chinese language is very simple, has only one syllable, monosyllabic. So you say Pu Tong Hua, how many Chinese words? Three. You, you say China, Zhong Wu, two syllables, two words. So it's understandable like that. So Mandarin would say, um, today's weather is very good. Mandarin would say, 今天的天气很好. But Sichuan, the spicy food originated from, and we say, 今天的天气很好. But in Shandong province, where Confucius was born, and we we'll say, 今天的天气真是好. But Mandarin will say, 今天的天气很好. So it's all different. So people from the north may not understand what people from the south would speak about. And then the people from the east would not understand people from the west. 
But how do they communicate? They are going to have a good way to do it. It's the written language. Doesn't matter where you come from, north, east, west, south, and you all use, they all use the same written scripts. Now, and then we talk about pinyin versus way the giles. Started in 19th century, more foreigners started to come to China, be it missionary or military or uh, the democ uh, um, Democrat, you know, uh, diplomats, all this coming in. So in the 19th century, Wade, W-A-D-E, is Thomas Wade, Mr. Thomas Wade. He was stationed in China as a military officer. And then he retired from that and worked as a diplomat in, in China. He started to study the sound that the Chinese language would, would use. And uh, so he came out with a certain uh, uh, ways to, to say, try to get the romanization of the sound of what typical Chinese would use. So, like the capital of city, it's called on the screen, Peking, P-E-K-I-N-G. He thought that's close enough. Then, in England, in Cambridge University, Professor Herbert Giles started to further develop and organize this pronunciation system. And uh, gradually, all the linguists would use that. And then also in the books, newspapers, atlas, and places, all started to adopt the system called Wade Giles. And uh, so, and then when, when in, when in the 1958, uh, 58, 1958, the People's Republic of China started to use a system called pinyin. So to, instead of way the jowls, what's pinyin? It's more close to the language used by the people in Beijing or some Northern parts of China. They think the language has more musical tone and more uh, uh, correct way to say it, more easy to be understood. So, they have, they did this pinyin system. Well, what's the difference? For example, now the capital city of China, we all know is Beijing. That's how Chinese would say it in, in, in China, Beijing instead of Peking. So Beijing, so, but Peking was used for, for a term. We have long time being adopted. So Peking duck, you don't call Beijing duck, that's delicacy, it's called Peking duck. Also, when people are doing Chinese exercise, now according to Pinyin, it should be said Tai Chi, it's the Tai Chi. So that's the difference between the, and uh, the Tao, Taoism, that's religions or and philosophy, but in Pinyin we call it Tao instead of Tao. Okay, so there's the difference. Now, it, on January first, nineteen seventy nine, United States established formal diplomatic relation with the People's uh, Republic of China and recognize it's the only 
legitimate government to represent the Chinese people. So after that, starting in the year of uh, 1979, you could see right away the State Department started to say news from Beijing is of Peking, no more with the Jiao's pronunciation. It's all pinyin. So, and uh, to, to do that, and also followed by uh, New York Times, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, Los Angeles Times, all these big newspapers gradually adjusted from Peking to Beijing and other words. Mainly this used to spoken Chinese language, pinyin, not only for speaking, but also for names, spelling of names and uh, spelling of place, okay, in China. So, Beijing now is, you know, officially being used. And so when you buy books, you look at the contents, the name spelling would be different than the books published in the 60s or 70s. So mainly because one is using Wade Giles, one is using Pinyin. For modern Chinese history, for example, people might understand the name of Jiang Kai-shek. Uh, probably you heard about him. He was the founder of the, 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 the president of the Republic of China, Chiang Kai-shek. That's most of the books and the newspaper was recorded at the time. But according to Pinyin, because Chinese call his name Jiang Jie Shi. So that's the way with the Jiang Jie Shi. Also, Chinese language, the special features, one word is one syllable. Second thing we have to remember, for third person, there's no gender. So when, you, when you're writing and writing, yes, there's way you could tell. But when you speak, he, she, it is all one word. So I also serve as a court interpreter. I recall in, in a case happening in Taos, I was in court. And the, the gentleman, the Chinese gentleman say, oh, I was driving on this icy road. And suddenly he, she, it opened the door and jump out. So I had to stop and ask the permission from the judge and stop and say, your honor, Chinese doesn't language, doesn't have the gender for the third person. So I need to verify from the plaintiff and what's the gender of the, the, the thing, the person that jumped out from the car. Finally, I verified and it was an old man so I say, he jumped out of the car. So the second one is no gender for the language. And number three, very general to say, there's no conjugation for the verb. Chinese thinking is that I go to school today. I go to school tomorrow. I go to school yesterday. We don't have to say, Go, will go, went. So just one word. The time phrase will identify it's the, the tense of the verb. So these are the easy things to remember about Chinese language. Now, we talk about Chinese population then. It's the four, the, that's the first one we already understand the, by area, the population. China makes one sixth of the world's population. Now, the Han people, the Han, it's a spelling to identify an ethnic group's name. So that's a pinyin, H-A-N, 
Han. It's about 90% of the population. And the rest of 6% consists of 55 minority groups. Now, in 1979, in July, at the time, Deng Xiaoping was the leader who and the, the, all the experts and the, the office, officers in the China government, they started to sense the vast and rapidly growing population. Later on will be problem. So they start the one child policy. Now, it's they took it very seriously. If it's an illicit uh, birth, the people, the family will get severe punishment. So one. Then after 37 years in 2016, then the, the leader Xi Jinping and discuss with the, all the experts, statisticians, and uh, uh, officials in the government, they says the fast growing agent working force, they need to, to uh, try to promote the problem population growth. So it's in 2016, after 30, 37 years, People are used to one-child policy and thinking of the high cost of education, housing, and the health care. So the two-child policy, it works for some families, and some families prefer a small family. Okay? So that's what the population. Now, then we talk about Chinese writing system. Chinese writing system early in the early days. The, it's, the legendary figure is Fu Xi. We're talking about over 2000 BC beyond that. Fu Xi started with this eight trigrams represent heaven, earth, lake and mountain, fire, water, thunder, wind. And use that. anything related to that, they just group it that. Very simple to do that. But later on, the feng shui, feng shui masters talk about feng shui, about the astrology, and then uh, the luck of the placing of the furniture and the house location, the graveyard location, all that. They started to rely on this Fuxi's eight trigrams. Now, the formatting of Chinese characters is started with pictograms by Changjie, Fuxi and the Changjie, so Changjie, pictograph. So if it's a sun, you draw a circle with a dot. And if it's moon, you have a half a moon with something in it. So that's how to do a tree, you draw like a tree. Now, and then they have indicative method. So if it's up, you have an arrow pointing up or you have an arrow, a dot pointing down. Associative uh, compounds. You, you use two pictograms or using part of the indicative method and combine two. Like you put a sun, on the left side of character and moon on the right hand of character, then you become brightness. And that's combined too. And you put a tree next to a tree and so have two components now and means woods or forest. Okay. And there are more, more other rules, but today we just mentioned this. And now the the Western language is using alphabets, A, B, C, D, you know, all this sound. But Chinese is the language for eyes, for vision, to see it. 
So we use basic radicals. The so-called basic radicals are the very simple character. It's being used in many words. So it's a common denominator for every characters. So nowadays in the Chinese dictionary, there are about 260-ish radicals. You look up the dictionary, not by alphabets like in the English, but you use the sound and the radicals and the, how many strokes of the character. Then you look it up. Now, the traditional Chinese writing is from right to left. Just mentally picture that. And then from up to down. So, and the book binding is set on the right side of the book. So it's completely different than the Western style. But China started to use Western way of doing the books because it will be easy to get to computer. It's horizontally typing things be it English or Chinese, you could do that. So that's the basic idea of Chinese writing system, okay? And then the style. And there, there are four very basic writing style. One is four very straightforward. Every stroke is doing that. And... Um, that's what's printed in books, newspaper, you use that. And then there's the seal script. That's for, it's kind of art, artistic form for doing that. And then there's clerical form. And then there's a cursive, really quickly handling doing that. Now, for this, I here invite you to join me on Friday evening and we'll have hand-on experience. And I will show you the style of writing. And before long, you could write some beautiful Chinese character in all four basic style of writing. And that would be fun and to do. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. And uh, we'll reserve that for Friday evening, okay? Now, the next thing we will talk about simplified versus traditional. So the, it's the writing system all the time from Confucius days, his classic, we could read it because it's all traditional system. But when, when Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao, before 1949, the, the civil war in China, he organized all the farmers. And the farmers have limited the education. Can't you see this example I gave you? The first line, this under traditional, the first one, how complicated that is for dust, it pronounced cheng, dust. And Mao said there about to be a better way for the illiterate people who are earning to, 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 to learn writing. So let's just make it simplify. What's simplify? You see the top is a xiao, means little. And then the bottom is dirt. To little dirt there is dust. So how easy that would be versus the traditional Chinese language writing. So, and then guo on the left side and then versus the one on the right side. So nowadays in China, the simplified uh, writing is being used nationwide. 
their textbook, the newspaper, everything is in, in Taiwan and the Singapore. And some big cities in the United States, when they have ch children's language school, they still use traditional Chinese. Other than that, it's all going simplified. But when it comes to calligraphy, I think Chinese will be written beautifully done by traditional language, writing language, okay? So this is something we know a little bit about Chinese um, writing system. Then we talk about Chinese literature. There's, it's the, it's so rich, the literature in, in Chinese history, but we would just want to get down to the Tang Dynasty. It's the golden age of Chinese civilization. Okay, that's almost uh, in the middle of 600 AD to close to early 900 AD. There's so many well-known poets and so many poems. And uh, I just pick one example, it's Li Bai who was born in 701 and lived for 61 years old and then passed away. He is a very, very well-known Chinese poet. His words choosing is very easy to be understood. They're the most simple Chinese poems will consist of four lines, and each line has five characters. So five sounds for one line. And for 20 sounds, syllables, it's a complete poem. And that will have a complete theme for the poet to express himself. The theme could be uh, country, uh, patriotic, you know, uh, thoughts or nostalgic for your family or your hometown or for love. That's the most common one in East and West, both, you know, for love. And so all these, the poem. Now, let me just recite one very simple Chinese poem to you. Only 20 characters. You could help me to count and say, Chuang Qian Ming Yue Guang. That's the first line. Yi shi di shang shuang. Second line, five words. Ju tou wang ming yue. Third line. And di tou si gu xiang. So 20 words. What it means is written by Li Bai. And uh, it's say he was traveling away from home. He, he said, oh, I saw the while I'm traveling. In, in the lodge, I look at the moon outside, you know, and it's shining. I miss my hometown and my family. And uh, I, I wish I could be with them. That's just the one. And this poem is so well known. And the kids, four or five years old, started to commemorate it. When I was in graduate school at Albany, I have, I was the only Chinese student and I have two Koreans studying with me. They knew this poem. They knew how to recite it. So it's very encouraging that beautiful verses of poem will be spread around nationwide. And, uh, and nowadays, I don't watch that much TV, but there's a wonderful program in China, from, in China, and they have a Chinese poetry competition. Over a thousand people participate. And on site, they have youngsters, like under, under 10, and then students group, and then 
the career people, working people, and then elderly citizens. And then they have thousands of people want to join virtual screen from the ground to the ceiling. It's a dome shape, all the people there. So for that competition. And the best thing is, yeah, they will invite well-known professors from different countries to come as not being judged, but as a commentary when the, they compete about a point and they would give a little bit background or the special mood of the poet when he wrote that and what's the similarity with other poems. So it, it's just a wonderful, very wonderful, interesting and educational program. So now you know the shortest Chinese poem will be only 20 words, four lines, but English sonnet will be 14 lines. So it's different uh, culture, different uh, uh, ways of express. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's good to know that people in China now really appreciate and enjoy poems. Okay, then we talk about novel and short stories. The person I want to introduce you is uh, Mo Yan. Literally means the Chinese name here we talk about, Li Bai Mo Yan. According to English, your family name is always the last. But Chinese name, Li Bai, Bai is the last name. Family name came last. And the more, no, first, I'm sorry, I made this big mistake. Li Bai Li is the last name. Family name came first. Mo Yan, Mo is the first name. Mo Yan is his pseudonym, pen name. And uh, Mo Yan literally means don't talk, Shh. quiet. Okay. He is a winner of Nobel Prize in Literature in 2012. But in the, two, in the year of 2000, there was Mr. Gao Xingjian, won the Nobel Prize in literature. But he, two years, two years before he got the honor, he became French uh, uh, Chinese. So, it didn't count. So Mo Yan was the first one, really, a Chinese uh, winning a Nobel Prize. All the time, when we read Nobel Prize in literature work, we have to read the translation. Unless you're fluent in Spanish, then you could read some Spanish writing in, the, in original language. It just happened in 2012. My siblings, we all had a reunion in China that winter, and we spent Thanksgiving together. And we stayed with my brother, who happened to have a very nice and comfortable home to have all of us, to put all of us there. And he has many books. He is an avid reader. So he had more yes book there. And I was so pleased, and no, Mo Yan just won the Nobel Prize. It's just a special feeling that you could read the, the book in the original language and to capture the original flavor of all this. So that's really a treat. Now, his works, including Red Sorghum Clan, and that became a movie. He was born in the province of Shandong. When you look at China, China, the map of China, on the east coastline, there's a little like a camel head sticking out. That's the province of Shan, Shandong. So Mo Yan came from Shandong, a small village called Gaomi. That's what happened there. The movie is based on that book. And then he, his mother was illiterate and bound feet woman, but care about education and encourage her son 
to read and to advance his study. So, but his mother, unfortunately, passed away before he, she could see that her son won such a worldwide honor. So the title, I just picked up a few, there are many. Big breasts and wide hips it stirred a lot of controversy in the literary world in China when it published. Actually, it's about women and motherhood and uh, the discrimination and how women could endure all the hardship and for her kids and her family and for herself. In a way, it's a little bit about he and his wife, uh, mother and the relationship about that. Okay, so you now know there's a Nobel Prize winner in literature, Chinese, and his name, easy to remember, Mo Yan, okay? Now, Chinese philosophy, um, it, it's very important to have personal ethics and morality. Now, Confucianism. Confucius was born in 551 BC to 479 BC. And during his lifetime, he uh, had 72, 72 disciples follow him, traveling to different places. Now, Confucius did something good. Before his time, only the rich people could receive education, or the royal family, of course. But the poor family, you don't get a chance to study. No schooling for those people. So Confucius was the one who started. Education should be for everyone. So what basically belief is benevolence. Do not do to others what others you do not want others to do to you. That's what Confucius believed. And right conducts. Always think, if in darkness, what you do things, is you should do it like thousands of eyes are watching you. Okay? So, so you do things right. And filial piety is to show respect to your parents. In Chinese, this is very important concept. It's called, in Chinese, it's called xiao. So respect to your parents, the that. And the wise thinking, you should have the wisdom. The knowledge should become wisdom, and you could use it efficiently. Then, Taoism, that which is Taoism with Giles, it's early in the 6th century BCE. Confucius believed everything should have a structure, hierarchy, rules. While Laozi, Taoism, just go with the flow, be free, you know, uh, let it go because everything is changing, always changing. Why is so stubbornly hold on to something? Just let it go. So it's completely different. So in China, the days I was growing up, we believe in your younger days, it's good to read Confucius classics and understand the rules and how to be a good citizen in a harmonious society. Then when you are established, when you feel like you 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 have the integrity and the knowledge and all that. You could be a Taoism practitioner, be free, and then you know you'll be doing good. So for those, many of you probably already read Benjamin, half the, the two books. So, and uh, it's very easy to, 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 uh, to understand. He using A.A. Milne's uh, books, characters, to explain the principles of Taoism. 
There are some stories in there, but I'm thinking my time is running out. I'm not going to talk, talk about a story, but those two books are easy, very short paperback and just easy to read. Okay, and then now talking about Chinese mythology uh, creature, Nian, the top one is Nian. The Ch Chinese New Year, you, you probably, you be in Chinatown or you have Chinese friends or you, you've been experienced some Chinese New Year. So what, what does it remind you? Noise, the crack, the crackling of the firecrackers. And then you probably hold your nose because the smoke, the aroma from the firecrackers. So that's early in the Chinese civilization started in a Neolithic period already. So in the 1920s, they have rail cuts being an earth and to prove that the civilization started with the you know, uh, Neolithic period. And the legend goes, this Nian animal, it also means Chinese New Year. The Nian will come up from the, come down from the mountain once a year during Chinese New Year. And, and it, they were fierce and were animal, um, animals and eating animals and people. And finally, people find out the way to scare them away is by firecrackers. They're scared of firecrackers and they're scared of red color. And Chinese always like to wear red colors for, for Chinese New Year. So the Chinese New Year. Now, dragon and the phoenix. Dragon and Phoenix is a, the, uh, a symbol, a harmonious symbol for a, a compatible and wonderful marriage. So in weddings, in big Chinese restaurants, for weddings will help in the hall. And the hall will have a big decoration of Dragon and Phoenix. And Chinese emperors always claim they're the dragon, they're the dragons and their wives are phoenix, okay? The third one's Bishou. That's the middle in the row, the vertical picture, the one in the middle. When you go to Chinese stores or some big office, you will see Bishou would be sitting and being displayed on the shelf. It's an animal, legendary animal. They it was told they were only be eating. What do they eat? No food. Gold, jewel. Of course, nowadays, probably diamonds too. Yeah. So all this. And then they don't have rectums. That's why they became a very popular mythological creature liked by business people especially because that means all the wealth will be coming in, but no way out. Isn't that the way you want to keep your wealth? So that's Pichu. Now, Qiling is the bottom one. Qiling is an is a animal. It's an auspicious animal. It will, when you see Qiling, you will see um, there will be a great sage being born, a great ruler would be leading the country. And uh, so Qiling, now Qiling, Qiling also is related to Confucius. Maybe you like to look it up. Confucius' dad had only had one son at the time, and the son had a feet defect, could not be allowed to go to the temple, family temple or clan temple to do any ceremony. So he remarried Confucius' mom. And the day before Confucius was born, Confucius', Confucius mom had a dream that she saw Qi Ling came with a boy and holding a Chinese musical, piping musical instrument, and a, a 
a lotus flower. So those are symbols to have a good son. So the second day, she had a son. So this is a well symbol. And in the Forbidden City, you will see a lot of qiling and dragon. There's a beautiful nine dragon ceramic tile, relief tile in Forbidden City. If next time you visit, you will see. Okay. Briefly, we will have Chinese sports and exercise. Just very briefly, ping pong. U.S. for since 1949, the People's Republic of China was founded. They isolate themselves, and it's called Iron Gate. Block others away. It was in 1971 that you know, um, 1971 that the U.S. ping pong team was in, in, uh, invited to China. And they went through Japan because they can't fly directly to uh, China. And then Olympic debut in, in 1988. And then Tai Chi. But now it's Tai Chi, but all people understand Peking Duck and Tai Chi. So I type Tai Chi in. The or opening ceremony in Beijing, they have 2,008 people performing in synchronicity to, you know, beautifully and doing that. But it's not uh, uh, authentic. And I practice, practice uh, Tai Chi almost on a daily basis. Don't worry, you uh, keep going about the presentation. It's okay if we go over the time. Those that have to uh, excuse themselves for other meetings and such may, but we're, we're going to keep the session open um, for as long as you'll present. Oh, okay. Oh, I was kind of rushing. Okay. <laughs> now, for doing Tai Chi and no special equipment, you don't need a mat, you don't need anything, and just yourself. And uh, in, it doesn't require a lot of space. I remember when one time when I was traveling in China, I was in the city of Xi'an, where's the terracotta soldiers? were found. So there, <clears throat> it was a rainy morning, <clears throat> excuse me. And I found out on my floor, at the end of the hallway, there's a little balcony out there. Eh, maybe four by, by eight or so. I just used that space and practice my Tai Chi. And just perfect. And uh, it improves your balance because you're always shifting weight from one leg, one foot to the other leg and other foot and balance. And then breathing. When you do the exercise and there's movements, more or less as a rule, when you bring your hands in, you breathe in. And then when you push out, you breathe out. So it's a breathing exercise. And uh, it helps you to build up muscles too. Because now for ladies, you want to have a smaller waist. Tai Chi is great. When you turn, you don't swing your shoulder. Uh, actually, you turn your waist 180 degrees almost. And then coming back. And that's doing that so give you flexibility and good exercise. Now Chinese food, I think everybody been to Chinese restaurant. So here I'm not spending time to talk about um, um, Peking duck or uh, Sichuan spicy noodle or all that. But one thing here we could talk about. Remember the the standard language is Mandarin. On Mandarin, we call Peking Duck. But on the menu, the immigrants came to, from China to United States. The early ones are from the province of Canton or on the East Coastline, the lower Southeast Coastline. So there's a dish. You could speak Cantonese. You probably don't realize. You could speak uh, uh, Wade Jiao's Peking Duck, and you could speak Cantonese. 
Have you heard of a mogu kai pen? That's a dish. That's in Cantonese. That's saying is that sliced chicken with sliced mushroom. But that dish was spelled out in Cantonese. So availability of natural resources. The, of course, started with starch staples. China has uh, two rivers, Yellow River and Yangtze River. Yellow River on the north, Yangtze River on the south. The Yangtze River, the north, the north part of Yangtze River, gen in general, the people's staple are wheat. And south of Yangtze River would be rice. So you, you, you go to, you, when you visit the northern cities, including Beijing, more pasta dishes, noodles. But in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, in, in uh, Guangzhou, more rice dishes, okay? Legumes, that green beans, Chinese have different type of green beans. Next time when you go visit a Chinese grocery store, try some. They call long string green beans. It's longer than your chopstick. If you have chopstick, you know what I mean. Longer than that. And it, it's, it's, it has a good taste. Now, vegetable. There are lots of different vegetables. And uh, besides Chinese cabbage, there are many different. And the fruits. There's also variety. Maybe you liked it. This is a season. The other day, my daughter-in-law, Donna, just offered me some lychee, fresh lychee. Now it's in season. And it's in a skin, and then it's juicy and with a little pit in the middle. So, and uh, meat. So Chinese eat any, many different, many different meats. And here I have to admit, before, they did eat dog meat. And later on, they find out it's not right. And so that being stopped for forbidden to eat dog meat. Okay. Process of preparing food. Fan and the cai, a balanced meal. Fan means rice, cook the rice. Now, when 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 English word rice. You, it could mean rice grain or cooked rice. But Chinese, when you say rice, it could be, you have to say fat is cooked rice. Mi, M-I, mi is rice grain, grain of rice. It's different. Now, so usually it's balanced meat. And quite general is there are at least two or more kind of meat. That's what most people did not get used to. Oh, I thought we were going to have beef or we just have chicken. But Chinese will have chicken and meat. No, that would be fine. Food is also medicine, especially in the southern part of China. Now, in the summertime, hot and humid, when you're in Hong Kong, and almost every block, there will be a small tea shop that would sell ice herbal tea. It's a little bit bitter, but it's good for you. Once you take it and it soothes your thirst uh, and also and, and, you know, to get rid of the heat and all that. So, and also Chinese believe women should have certain food in certain stage of their life, they should have certain food to, uh, to nourish their, the change of their bodies. And for guys, they have different food too, to, to offer to for guys. So it's also a medicine. Now, Taofu, in Pinyin, should be Taofu. That's what Chinese say, should be Di, but it says Taofu and bean curd. That's, that's before uh, like 600 BC 
already been uh, invented tofu. And it came in many forms. When you go to a Chinese market, next time when you visiting a place, have a big Chinese market, you will be surprised to see how many varieties of products they offer in, 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 the, in the shop. Some are fresh ones, fresh tofu, you have to keep ideally refrigerated, you know, to be refrigerated. And good store in water, in a container of water, and seal it and put it in refrigerator. And then there's a beaker sheets in the skin. So it's soft and you could, you could do, you know, with meat or seafood or vegetable, you could wrap it up and then fry it and steam it. So soft one. And there's some dry ones. So you could keep a shelf life will be for a longer period of time. So you could buy that. And then you could soak in water to restore the freshness. So many, many forms. And then fermented the tofu. And some of you might heard of it, this stinky tofu. Not everybody develop a taste for it, but some people do like a lot. Otherwise, it would not be a popular snack. Now, um, etiquette for seating. Usually, when you get to a restaurant, before the host came and to seat you, usually the guests will be standing there, especially the honorable person or couple will be seating in the dining room or a special room facing the entrance. And then the host and hostess will be on the opposite side. Okay. And then talking about drinking, Chinese use the term gan bei. Literally translation would be cheer uh, I mean, cheer up, but it means bottom up the glass, finish everything. So the, here I will share a tip with you. And it could be useful when you get together with lots of Chinese friends for the first time or go, you're visiting China. When they came up to you and proposed a toast, say, Gan Bei. if you could do it, you do it. But bear that in mind. It's not one person. It, it doesn't end there. That means the whole table, those people, one by one, they will come to, to toast to. And they will say, Gan Bei. if you bottom up with the first one, and you have to do it with the second one. So you know your limit. The first time you've finished it, then you have to go through, through that. Otherwise, you have to to spend a lot of time to explain. Uh, there's one item I like to add to the Chinese food culture. It's of course tea. Chinese drinks tea. And uh, the earliest record is that is by a person. And they, he was called the sage of tea. And his name is Lu Yu. He wrote the classic of tea. It's the uh, the only earliest and most complete record talking about cultivating, making, and drinking, and tea utensils, all this about tea. And the Chinese started to drink tea long time. And Lu Yu is in the dynasty of Tang. Even though we did not have a special section on, on uh, history, but throughout the slides, we talk about the, the you know, a touch of the history. And later on, of course, the culture of tea service and tea ceremony and went to Japan. And Japanese seemed to like it very much. And, and we're glad, you know, the Chinese people could share that with them. So next, I want to talk about Chinese major holidays. Please remember, Chinese people from the ancient time 
always use and adopt lunar calendar instead of Gregorian calendar. So all these calendar mentioned here on the slide, except uh, the second one is will go decided by the, the climate and then the, the atmosphere of the whole universe or so they decide on the day. But Chinese New Year's Day, always the first day of the Lunar New Year to start it. And, uh, and the holiday lasts for 15 days. It's called Spring Festival. And for detail, you people know, firecrackers and uh, uh, good food. And children especially enjoy to receive red envelope with lucky money in it handed down by their parents or uh, the elders. Um, so usually Chinese, this is the biggest holiday, just like the Christmas in, in the States. The second one is Qingming Festival. It's a tomb sweeping day. Let's go back to uh, Confucius pile piety. So, if you go to your ancestors' tomb, really clean, and then the family will gather there and will bring food to have an offering there. So that's family time too. Now, Dragon Boat Festival is May 5th of the uh, lunar calendar. And it's because in the, in the ancient time, there was... Uh, poet and uh, uh, scholar, name is Qu Yuan. His, he gave good advice to his king, Chu Wang, but the king didn't listen to him and lost the battle and lost the country. So Qu Yuan was so frustrated and that's not a good way to do it, but he jumped into the lake, river. And uh, since then, people will get a wrap up food, a wrap up uh, meat or vegetarian fillings with sticky rice, wrap up and then with uh, bamboo leaves to tie it up and steam and boil for some time it would be a special food for this holiday. And they would throw into the river in the beginning to hope the sea creatures would not will leave, I mean, will leave Chu Yuan alone. So this, to this day, lots of Dragon Ball Festival, and then um, they, would, they would enjoy special food too. And a special wine called Xiong Huang Jiu. They use Elgor mineral, grind it, and you could, you could buy them from the Chinese herbal store or so, and uh, mix with wine and to drink on that day only. And then comes Qi Xi Festival, Chinese Valentine's Day. It's talking about this uh, uh, herd boy and the uh, weaving uh, maiden. To begin with, this maiden is the royal family in, in, the, in the heaven. And uh, the, this herd boy is a poor boy. But anyway, they got married. So the emperor was very mad because the, the daughter should be focused on weaving for the royalties to, to, to have very cloud silk and fancy stuff. But so they were forbidden to meet. It's only on... July the 7th, lunar calendar, July 7th, they will meet because the, the Milky Way will be there. And uh, uh, they could meet and the birds will make a bridge for them, for them to meet, okay? And then Mid-Autumn Festival, that's August 15th, lunar calendar every year. That's just almost like Thanksgiving for the family to be together. 
And usually people would make time to come home to, to uh, have family feast. And especially that's the, supposed to be the roundest moon, full moon in the year. So after dinner, the family would gather in the courtyard and enjoy uh, uh, be get together to, to visit and doing that. So according to Chinese legend, there was a fairy lady lived in the um, moon. And there's another story. But sometimes if you feel interest, look it up. And then here I have limited the time. His name is Chang'e. Just remember C-H-A-N-G-E, change, drop the E. C-H-A-N-G. And the E is E, just E, E, Chang'e. And uh, that's the fairy lady living in the moon. Now, remember, when China landed the first satellite in moon, and they named it Chang'e, C-H-A-N-G-E, and then Yi, the se separate word. And then it, it was a great news for the, for the nation, but also lots of people felt heartbroken because no more fair lady there, you know. So that's mid-August <laughs> festival. Chinese fair, uh, family paragon. Now, ancestor worshiping. Usually in, in some families, they will have an altar in, their, in a place, in their house, living room, be living room or study or somewhere to have uh, the name of the ancestor or the picture of the ancestor. And then some incense will be burning and, uh, and some fruit, fresh fruit will be offered. So especially Qingmingjie, remember we talk about that, that's a ancestor worshiping day too. Number two, we talk about paleo, paleo uh, piety. That's xiao, that means to pay respect to your parents. And I remember there's just quite a number of rules to respect. When I was little, I recall, if my parents have friends over, and they talk, and we'll be sitting there. We are not supposed to interrupt. Unless you are being asked, then you say, not like here. But now I've been here so long. And either way, I could see there's pros and cons. Yeah, just the time, the, the way people do it, it's different. And family honor. And uh, you always think, not yourself but family first. I recall when I came over to the States, my mom would say, you, a daughter, I just remember lots of people might not have seen a Chinese before. So how you behave, how you talk, that, that's how people would think Chinese would do. Ooh, that just scares me. Just, you know, and that's a lot of burden just to think about that. But that's, that's the way Chinese would think. Age before beauty. Elders always being respect. Elders always being uh, pay special attention to. In the, uh, I recall when I came to the States, the second semester, I took a part-time job at uh, a state of a, a library of state of New, Mex New York and the processing center. And uh, I will be doing filing. That's, it's not digital things yet, not computerized. So you file the catalog cards and I sit on a high stool and doing that. And this Mrs. Robinson will come up to me and check with me. I, I think it's okay. She's very friendly. Wherever she came, I'm short. I was just barely a little bit over five feet. And I had hopped down the high stool and say, yes. And then every time I hop, and finally she asked me, why you hopped up and down? I say, because you're old. I respect you. You ought to see her eyes. You think I'm old? Well, I 
I just came to the state. That's my second semester. And I thought, this year's old, all white hair and all, you know, uh, wisdom of the uh, uh, age is showing on her face and everything. But the tone of her voice told me it's a no-no. I shouldn't say she's old. So I, I finally come up with, I say, even though you're just, you know, a little bit older, a year or so older, I should I need to respect you. He said, okay, okay, don't bother to hop and down. We're, you know, Grace, just fine doing that. So that's right. And also in China, the most two popular questions they ask you, that shows they like you. Number one is how old you are. Number two, how much do you make for living? And uh, maybe I've been stand, spending too much time in the States it just turned me off to ask how old you are or how much you make. So please don't ask how old I am to me or to my children. Okay, thank you. And uh, so age and that. And family value. Every family have value. I think I could say it for all the immigrants from, uh, from China or from whole Asia country, Asian countries as well education. In my family, my mother thought education is the best assets in life. It, you won't lose it as long as you, you're conscious. You know, it will go with you wherever. Whatever you have between your two years, that belong to you and you never lose. And so family value, honesty, and all this. Oh, Chinese customs and birthday celebration. Uh, shall we say just 60 years ago or so in China, they do not celebrate kids' birthday. I, my family was unusual. My parents always celebrated our birthdays. But all my classmates, they never had birthday celebration. All they had was a special bowl of noodle that stands for longevity for birthday and uh, with some meat or seafood or uh, uh, an egg to it. So that's it. But the older people, for those who enjoy Chinese classic, reading Chinese classic, you recall the, the red, the chamber of uh, the, the dream of red chamber in English name is that. The grandma, Jiamu, when she came to her birthday celebration, they would invite for rich family, very common. They would invite a group of performers to come to their big mansion in the backyard and to perform operas and invite all the neighbors and friends to come over to enjoy. But birthday celebration. So nowadays, especially one child policy in China, in every restaurant you go where I travel in China, boy, boy that's a little prince or little princess. They will have all the people there, a big birthday cake and all the relatives. And remember one child policy, means two sets of grandparents be together. Now, drinking hot water, and uh, somehow they, in the winter time or even summertime, they enjoy drink hot water. They believe ice water, uh, especially very hot day, and go into your body, and that's not, uh, the temperature would not match. So it would not do any good for your health. Now, uh, uh, fruit sharing, any fruits but a pear. A pear is uh, easy. L-I, li, is Chinese pinyin, just a li. Li is a pun for separation. So you don't separate. So, you, you know, that means you separate with someone, li. So not a, a, a pair. 
And when it comes to gift giving, to give a clock is a taboo because that means in Chinese language, it means to attend your funeral. So it's, it's not good to give a, a, a clock or a knife. That's a sharp you know, uh, weapon. So those are the taboos not to do it. And uh, lucky numbers. Chinese has some lucky numbers. Number eight, just to name one, eight. How many of you recall the last Olympic held in China in the year of 2008? And in the August, the 8th of August, and in the evening, eight minutes after 8 p.m., because eight is a lucky number. Eight is ba, when you say in Chinese, B-A. Remember, pinyin's easy. Today, I'll give you a lot of example, very short and easy pinyin. B-A is ba. Ba means prosperity and wealth and good luck, all this. So it's like a good number. And you see lots of people, when they do business, they, they would like to have a phone number with a lot of an eight or license plate with eight. Okay. Off, oh, well, offering and receiving with one hand or both hands. I will go back to gift, giving here to touch one point. Now here in the States, when you receive a gift, gift you're supposed to open it right away and express your surprise, your delight, and your gratitude. But in China, people thought it would be rather awkward to open in front of the giver. So they waited until you, the person, the giver left, and then they will open the gift. Now, when the elders give you something, you should always receive with both hands. And it's about the same level that you could give one hand. And I recall when I taught a class and the, the kid, the high school kid would give me some, some, some homework or so, just one hand drop on the desk. And I told the whole class. So from now on, when you give to teacher things, it will be good to have two hands and with eye contact, just to show respect. Okay, so I think this just barely touched. Now, because of the session was limited to one hour, I did not touch the, uh, the topic of, you notice, religion and politics. So thank you again. We, it's always good to hold on to your heritage and culture and understand culture and heritage of other people and respect everybody and uh, embrace that diversity. That's important to make the world more beautiful. Okay, thank you all, bye-bye. With that said, I'm gonna leave it open to any discussions. I know that we need to respect everybody's time, so please, Feel free to um, unmute and um, ask Ms. Hsu any questions that you might have. So I could see it in two ways. Either everybody's so familiar with the topic <laughs> they, they don't really have any new questions or the speakers may not stir up enough interest to raise any questions. <laughs> so, so, but anyway, I enjoy doing this and sharing my experience with Chinese culture and Chinese heritage. And uh, 
I, I just think it's, it's great that to have the opportunity to be here. And once again, we thank you, Ms. Xu, for um, enlightening us on the Chinese culture and the history on all aspects of everything. And again, as Ms. Xu had um, expressed earlier, she is also um, hosting um, and presenting on um, Chinese calligraphy um, this coming Friday at um, 5.30. Um, she will be um, guiding us through the history and, and um, the preparation of Chinese calligraphy. And we ask that you join in on that event also, and also bring in and enjoy a glass of wine. And this is gonna be a very interesting and engaging um, event. So without, if there are no further questions, um, we appreciate you joining in. And again, we thank you, Ms. Xu, for um, sharing all of your experience and um, wisdom in regards to Chinese culture. Thank you, Angie. And uh, please join me on Friday evening. So have a hands-on life experience with Chinese writing brush. See it you will be fun. Wonderful. If you Thank, could. You. Thank you so much. Um, this has just been absolutely wonderful. And I could definitely say I can listen to you all day um, to really dive into these topics. Um, it's just absolutely fascinating and educational and um, has actually helped clear up a lot of things uh, for my own education, which is great. And I'm really looking forward to uh, the Friday event um, and want to thank you again for doing both of them. It's wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. So everybody have a great and, uh, See some of you you know, on Friday evening. Bye-bye. Sounds good. Bye-bye, everyone. Enjoy.